Here we are at the Medina Bicentennial Celebration. We have a Civil War encampment right behind us. We're gonna go explore this. Come on along. Tell me a little bit about the uh, the Ohio Eight. When did this uh, When did this form? Uh, they went into service in uh, May of 1861 as a three-month regiment, and before their three months were out, they went in as a three-year regiment and were sworn into service in June of 1861, and served from June of 1861 until July of 1864, and did not veteranize, and the unit went out of existence in 1864. Wow! But you know, we honor the veterans. You know, we thank mm -hmm. them for their service. Well, these fellows are all gone. Yeah. But we don't want people to not remember what they did, too. Well, my dad said that he could remember uh, in the 1930s that there were still yep. Civil War veterans, veterans around. Yes. Yeah. And you would see them from time to yeah. time. Now, the modern Ohio 8th, okay. when, when did that form? I started the modern 8th in 1982. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I had assumed that it was going to be a little bit more. So you were a young man then. Yeah, back then, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, and you started this. Yeah, I, I got into reenacting in late '79, early 1980, and served for about two years. And the unit I was in at that time dissolved, and so it was either well, we could you know hunt around for another unit, or maybe I'm from Cleveland. Okay. And so maybe start one of our own. And I was actually in grade school with a descendant of an 8th Ohio veteran. Wow. And again, I've been interested in the Civil War since I was a little kid. And so when we were looking around to start our own unit, being from Cleveland, Company B of the 8th Ohio was out of Cuyahoga County. <clears throat> Prior to the Civil War, Company B specifically was the Hibernian Guard Social Club. It was wow. an Irish social club. Mm -hmm. So I'm of Irish heritage. I live in Ohio. I'm sorry, I live in Cleveland. The company was from the area. They also fought in the Eastern Theater, and that was my, you know, interest. So it all dovetailed together. So we became Company B of the 8th Ohio. Wow. How far have you gone with this? I mean, as far as travels? Um, England. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yes. You guys went to England. Yeah. And did and the American Civil War in England three times. Well, back in the in the late 80s. And just and just to be sure, I mean, if there's anybody who really needs to have a musket pointed at them, uh, no, I'm kidding. No, no, you're talking to an Irishman. <laughs> Keep going. I'm Welsh and Irish. Oh, so jeez. I'm Griffith. At least he's not a freaking Sazana. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I have some Scott in oh, me too. Oh, well, you're, you're, so yeah. every time we say the Queen, we have to do this. <laughs> and you know, absolutely. Ross. Yes. Uh, McNearney sounds like an Irish name. Yeah, a bit, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to say. Uh, and and uh, how do you feel about that heritage? Do you have the, you have the harp on your... Uh... Um, I, I don't even know how to put this delicately, but 
the way America perceived Irishmen back then, I don't know that people would have really been flaunting that as much. Really? So, Oh, so, yeah, you're, you're and right. Trying to be realistic, um, I don't, on, on St. Patrick's Day when we're in the parade, I will wear it. But as far as advertising that heritage, you know, yeah. we were second, third class citizens. So yeah. I don't think it's something that we've done regularly. <clears throat> but it is tattooed here. Did the, did the, uh, it is tattooed? Yes. Wow. All right. So, uh, so uh, the Irish heritage in, uh, and, and its involvement in the Civil War, did that, change anybody's perception of the Irish after the war? I wouldn't say it was immediate, but I think it was one of those things where, you know, it didn't just end after the Civil War, it went to the Indian Wars, it went, you know, beyond that. And I think, and I hate to call us good citizens because I sort of know better, but on the, <laughs> I think as time went on, the accent lessened, you know, they were able to almost hide their identity a little yeah. bit more, and, and that was probably more helpful than anything. Because I think we were still hearing about the Irish in a negative way, even into the 19-teens well, and the 20s. Well, if you consider, it wasn't, yeah. right, it wasn't until 1964 yeah. that, right, yeah. that we elected finally an Irish Catholic president, because yeah. there was, we were afraid he would answer the Pope before his constituency. So. Yeah. This just seems like a whole level of commitment not only on, on uh, you know, just the, the, what we're seeing here today, but what you're probably having to go through at, at home, just make, maintaining equipment, buying materials. Uh, this is not, I wouldn't call this a hobby. You well, know? I'm, I, I'm lucky I have a very, very supportive wife about this stuff that actually helps me prep meals and make sure that my clothes are clean and things like that. But, but you're right. Um, but I don't think we think of it in terms of the dollars or like, I would feel remiss if I wasn't here this weekend. I would feel like not only did I let my my guys down, but also the men that we're trying to honor. Yeah. And this is why the money, the time, the travel, I mean, yes, they're real things, but that's not at all why we do it. Right. Uh, the, the what I'm, I'm watching around here, I'm looking around and I am seeing that there is an awful lot of interaction going on between the men of your company and the people who have come here today to to see what's going on and to see this and they're they're uh, interacting they're teaching they're showing their wares they're showing the and they're, and they're probably even giving a little bit of a history lesson uh, while they're doing this uh, to me this is infinitely better than anything that you would find from a a, a stone monument or anything that th this is is and that's why we're here the kids that you know you see the kids interacting they're not going to remember the statues of stones but this is probably something they'll remember for their lives oh yeah the rest of their lives how young are you 16 16 16 and you're the new recruit yep so we're going to have you in uniform soon and you're going to be yeah and you're going to be uh you're going to be drilling with these guys mm -hmm. going different places doing things now tell me as a 16 year old what do you know about the civil war uh, what do you mean? Oh, well, like, uh, who, who fought it? <laughs> Confederates and the Yankees? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And uh, when did it happen? 1861 through 1865. So, and where did it start? Uh, Fort Sumter. Man, this kid, already, he's got it down. And, and uh, what happened at, at, a, at Appomattox? That's not an easy uh, thing to say. Appomattox. Oh, that's, an, yeah. Yeah. that's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. There was, there was a guy named Grant and a guy named Lee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And or, oh, duh. Yeah. Uh, F yeah, Lee surrendered to Grant. That's right. That's and right. did he surrender the entirety of the South, or did he just surrender the Army of Northern Virginia? Uh, Army of Northern Virginia. Yeah, isn't that right? Yep. That's Guys, absolutely right. isn't this kid incredible? <laughs> Uh, Rick, what can you tell me about the weapon before we go through demonstration? Uh, Company B, 8th Ohio, we used uh, 1853 Enfield musket. Mm -hmm. It's a rifled musket. It uses a mini ball, uh, mm -hmm. which actually spins the round. To load this musket, it takes, there's nine steps. And even in battle, the soldiers had to do it every single time to load the musket. Loading in nine times. Load. So the soldier puts the musket between his legs, puts his hands on his cartridge box. Next command is handle cartridge. Soldier reaches in, grabs a pre-made cartridge, got has the bullet and the powder inside of it, and he puts the cartridge in his teeth. 
Next command is tear cartridge. So he rips the top off the cartridge and he puts it at the top of the, of the muzzle. Next command is charge cartridge. So he pours the powder in there, takes the bullet, and he starts, presses the bullet in the top of the, of the barrel. Next command is draw rammer. Pulls the rammer out and puts it on top of the bullet. Next command is uh, ram cartridge. So he pushes the ball all the way down on top of the powder. Next command is return rammer. Takes it out, puts it back in his holder. And the next command is prime. Which he gets the weapon ready and he takes a cap and he puts it on top of the cone, on top of the musket, and he's ready to fire, waiting for the next command from, from the officer. Uh, the cap was, uh, I forgot how many grains, but it's fulminated mercury that, that uh, produces a little spark. So how often could a, uh, a really experienced Civil War soldier, Union soldier, Confederate, how often could they fire, say, in one minute? The, the, the standard answer is a, a good soldier could load and fire three aimed rounds in a minute. We've tried it many, wow. many times and it's quite difficult. I would imagine. Yes. I think it would, uh, you're figuring that's 20 seconds 20 to seconds. load under, under pressure. Correct. Uh, I mean, and that's not like a little bit of pressure. And normally they didn't fire that fast in battle. Yeah. These, the muskets and the powder they had back then, these muskets fouled quite quickly. Um, so a lot of times during battle, the soldiers were pouring water down the barrel, trying to clean, clear the barrel out so that they could get the bullet uh, down inside yeah. it. After about 10 rounds, these, these barrels will foul up where wow. you, you would not be able to ram the bullet down. And there are stories of, of guys actually taking the rammer, seeding it, and pushing against a tree to drive that bullet down in. No kidding. Um, when you had opportunity, or to, to, you said you had opportunity to, to try and do three rounds a minute, and obviously you, you weren't really quite capable of doing that, uh, you said that that was not something that they generally did in battle. That's correct. It was more controlled, it was more, you Yes, because really they, all they had was 40 rounds, so if they did three rounds in a minute, you're talking yeah. very quickly that we go through the rounds. So you're really trying to uh, place the rounds downrange in a more controlled way so that you're going to be able to use those rounds more effectively. Absolutely. And to date, of course, the, the most Americans that have ever died in any war. Right. Yes. Uh, being because of course they were dying on both sides uh, any lessons things that you have learned about your experiences in doing this that yes, give you pause a lot. <laughs> yeah a lot. Um, i thought before i started reenacting i thought i knew a lot about the civil war i yeah. realized i knew nothing yeah. uh, this was to, to really if you love the civil war and you really want to understand it you need to reenact to, to actually, and we still don't even come close to what the actual soldiers did, but we get a little taste of it. And it's absolutely amazing what they did. Heartbreaking in many cases. Yes, yeah, it just puts put it puts into perspective. And whether you're just, you know, eating around a campfire, or living in camp, sleeping in rain, mud. mud. Or you're actually out on the battlefield. It just puts everything in perspective, and we hope we even come close to, to doing it. Now, we, we like to say when you get to the pearly gates, if the boys are waiting there for you, they're either going to take you and shake your hand and say thanks, or going to, or they're going to slap you across the face and say, "What the heck were you doing? <laughs> you had it all wrong." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when well, at that moment you just say, "Well, teach me." Yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff. I really hey, appreciate it you. so much, Rick. Sure. I you. really appreciate what you've done in the time you've taken. This yeah. is a more relaxing kind of an atmosphere. You got your you got your uh, your your coat cool. unbuttoned a little bit, so you're cool, cooling to off. Cool off a little bit. Yeah. Just smoking my pipe, drinking my coffee, yeah. taking it easy. All right, and the coffee is from our coffee right from here from the fire. Right from here. I'm going to say that coffee is almost paint at this point. That's how we like it. Yeah. <laughs> you need a spoon for the coffee? Is that Sometimes. What you know? Yeah. That's now for the guys in the Civil War when they're out in it and amongst it, uh, you know, out in the field, is bacon and eggs something that they often would have? You'd be having uh, 
uh, hardtack and salt pork. Yeah, we're is, right back to hardtack and salt pork. They, they were telling us about that earlier. Yeah. Is that, have you ever had hardtack and salt pork? I have. I, I've, I've, uh, it's not, not, not pleasant. Not pleasant. <laughs> and nobody likes this stuff. I have to try this hardtack stuff. We've already had a little bit of an introduction about what we know about uh, the guns and a little bit about the Civil War in general. What we want to know now is about camp life. What right. is camp life right like? Well, uh, we get up uh, in the morning. We make our breakfast, uh, drink a, drink our coffee. Uh, you know, try and uh, try and relax. Yeah. Get up. And, first thing, yeah. First thing, we get up and we take roll call. Yeah. Then we drill. Then we, then then we, we drill. Morning. Then we drill some more. <laughs> and then after that, more drill. More and drill? then we have our morning coffee. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure the drills are nice and light and easy. Nothing, uh, nothing too heavy. Uh, uh, Depends on uh, first Siren's mood. <laughs> traveled all over the United States. Uh, we came to Cleveland, Ohio once. We came to Worcester, Ohio once. Mm -hmm. And then we took it overseas to Europe four times crossing the great waters after we convinced the Native Americans that the great spirit of the waters would protect them. They were afraid to cross them, but we, uh, we got them to go with us. And um, so we went to every um, country in Europe. And, and did you, did you, times. yeah, did you uh, perform for any of the great and wonderful royalty of Europe? Uh, Queen Victoria, and then at one time we uh, performed for five kings and all of their children, the princesses. Um, and they uh, had us uh, had me shoot at a running deer target, and I hit my mark. Oh, fantastic! This is awesome. Now, one of the things, of course, that I think sure that every young girl out there watching. Armstrong Cable right now would want to ask is how did you learn to shoot so well? What did what what is it that I mean that was usually now forgive me a guy's thing. How did you get involved in this? Um, when I was eight years old, um, I studied the uh, Kentucky uh, rifle, um, and then that's where I hit my first mark. So my dad taught me a little bit, um, and by the age of fourteen, I had ha uh, managed to hit enough. Uh, small game to sell to pay off my family's mortgage. So, mm -hmm. hard work, determination. Just because you're a lady doesn't mean you can't hold a uh, hold a rifle. That's right. And even if they're not interested in firearms, give a little encouragement to the to the young ladies out there that might want to do all kinds of things, play in sports, uh, anything that they might want to do. Uh, as women, we're strong. We're you know we're independent. Um, we can do anything that a man can do. And better. And better. <laughs> Frankly, I think a lot better. <laughs> and there you go. I think we just quoted the song. Follow your dreams, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's something, it was pure, struck, I mean, just genius that you had her go, I bet you she was the main attraction. I came up with the idea that because all the West was the Wild West and it, people in the East was reading all the stories and stuff and it had become quite... Uh, calm around here but so I got this idea that if I had Annie go on stage first Ooh. and all the ladies that brought their children with them would be sitting there and they'd be expecting that uh, all hell's gonna break loose when people start shooting guns but they would see Annie Oakley hitting all these targets and they would start to relax and then I'd bring on the big acts the cowboys the Indians uh, robbing the Deadwood stage all these uh, bigger uh, things that were going on out there, they didn't get upset and they even enjoyed it. And Queen Victoria was even uh, seen a couple times smiling. Ooh. That, Ooh. that was a big one. That ah, well, I, and uh, anybody who's ever seen a picture or any kind of likeness of Queen Victoria cannot imagine that face smiling uh, because it's uh, not exactly... Uh, uh, actually, most people that look at her face went, ah! For the folks out there that want to learn more about Annie Oakley and Buffalo Bill, are there any movies or uh, books or anything that you would suggest that they uh, well, try to go find? there's plenty of books. I've got several right here. But yeah? the movies don't, don't really show that much about the whole, yeah. you know. 
No, you got to sit down and read a little bit at a time. And the Annie Oakley Museum is uh, about three hours west of here. Oh yeah, where so, is yep, it? Uh, Dark County. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's um yeah, it's about three hours west of here. They have Annie Oakley days in the summertime. Um, that's actually where she was born and raised. No kidding. So, yep. Fantastic. Yep. What city is that near? Is that um, kind of close to Dayton, Cincinnati? That's where Excellent. she used to sell a lot of her wild game to the restaurants, hotels. So we're just area. talking about just it just mm -hmm. a, it's just really a day trip. It's a day trip, yeah. Three and hours. I'm sure there's lots about her mm -hmm. life in there. Life and, in there. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, you'll be the main attraction. <laughs> All right. Thank you so she much. Always was. That's right. Thank you very much, <laughs> thank and thank you, you very much, you. both of you. This is amazing. They spent a lot of time pulling this together. Oh, I tell you, yeah. First time ever. They had yeah. no idea how it was going to go over, and this is phenomenal to see this here. I was absolutely shocked at how much I have seen going on yeah, here, and beautiful. how well organized it has been. Absolutely. They have awesome signage. The crafters are amazing. The soldiers were so kind in giving about their stories. This mm -hmm. is incredible. This is this is huge kudos for the committee that did this. Excellent. Well, I, you have every reason to be, and everybody watching here right now in Medina City, Medina County, and in the viewing public, they have a lot of reason to be very proud of what the they city is doing. Be. Absolutely. Yeah. Marcy lives right here in Medina. We're getting it, sort of. <laughs> and and Molly lives in? in Chicago, Illinois. So uh, as being an outsider from, from way, way far away, what do you think about this little thing that they're doing here in Medina? This is awesome. This is a great way to celebrate our heritage and uh, to honor all of our veterans. Yeah. Living and deceased. They're That's awesome, awesome people. I do. I really do appreciate seeing all of this and seeing all of the people really kind of put their heart and soul and try to teach the, the younger generation and people younger than even me mm -hmm. and just kind of make them awe inspired. You guys are with the uh, the Friends of the Cemetery Club, yes. right? Yes, I'm the president. You are the president. I am the president. Oh my yes. gosh. Well, tell me a little bit about what you guys do. Well, our mission is to, pr to promote the preservation, the historic preservation, and the maintenance and the beautification of Medina's two city cemeteries. You have two city cemeteries. We do. And you we have... have Spring Grove here, where mm -hmm. we are, and Old Town Graveyard Uptown. That was the first graveyard where the founding fathers of okay. Medina are buried. And I also serve on the Bicentennial Celebration Committee, and somebody brought up the idea of having a Civil War encampment. We were thinking, where could we have it? And I said, well, why not at, the, at Spring Grove? We have these beautiful lawns out front, and this is where at least 163 soldiers, or yeah. Civil War soldiers, are buried. So yeah. That's how. Now, another thing that I notice is that we have a lot of these t-shirts. And Dottie, I'm going to ask you about the t-shirts because you are sporting one. I am. And I am so jealous. Thank you. It, I'll bet you want one. And I do. And you're only $15. Really? So you can buy one right over there. I have to get one now. I think you do. $15. But let's say the people... A bargain at any price. A, a deal at twice the price. Exactly. Yes. And there oh, that's, that's my the best side. What? <laughs> Your best side. Oh, yeah. All the way around here. Do a nice spin. Baby, there spin it is. Baby, okay. Spin baby. <laughs> Dottie. Well, anyway. Okay, yes. So, have you been drinking? Never. Never. <laughs> During the morning. During the morning. <laughs> I get it. Okay, anyway. That's right. And how much would t-shirts cost? 15? They would cost $15, yes. Awesome. Yes. Any size, $15. Any yeah. size. So I could get a really big one, cut it in two, and yes. have two t-shirts. Uh, uh, yeah, it would be an interesting look, yes. 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 And so I have the, lots of interesting looks. The, the, the 3X would be $15, and I, so is the, the youth medium. Oh, really? $15. $15. $15 mm -hmm. all the way through. $15 all the way across. You are not penalized for being big or little. I think Excellent. that's nice. I think that's wonderful. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, tell me one more thing about the Friends of the Cemetery that I wouldn't know. We found additional Civil War graves when we marked all 163 on Wednesday night. Really? There were more that were not documented. <laughs> that Isn't is that worth cool? doing this whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Just so, so that's that... our, one of our next projects. Really? Is to find out who they are. Yeah. So that they are recognized. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably don't get a whole lot of thanks. Um, you know what I mean? For doing what you're doing. But wow, do we have a debt. I mean, everybody here in the county, and they probably don't even realize half of what's here. They don't, and I think that, well, I know that that's one of the reasons that we did this event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because this came from the rural cemetery movement, so that it's a city park. You're to, you're to utilize it and, yeah. and come and enjoy. And 
the last thing we want is for our loved ones to be ignored. They yeah. need to be remembered. So come and enjoy and treat it respectfully, but it's a park. It's, it's meant to be shared. Tell me a little bit about this process, if you don't mind my asking. Sure. So this is the wet plate collodion process. It was originally developed in 1851. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a sheet of aluminum, pouring chemicals on it to make it light sensitive, taking the image, developing the image on the spot. And it's called wet plate because the, the first chemical that I pour has to stay wet until I'm finished, which is about 10 minutes. And what's your name? My name is Michael Rhodes. Michael, fantastic job. See a negative outside of a dark room. This is the only way you can see a negative. Right. Only, well, negative turn into, when I put it in here, it's going to turn into a positive. Okay, let's definitely get a picture so, of that. So it's kind of like an 1850s Polaroid. <laughs> Oh, you can see it starting to happen around the edges. Yeah, usually the edges first. You usually pick a side. That is incredible. It's kind of got a little bit of a ghost image in it, and now it's starting to really come out more and more. As it's re re What's the chemical that's in this? Sodium thiosulfate, so what a photographer would call a fixer. That is incredible. And the image is so incredibly clear. They, they are. Most people don't realize that this process actually produces images sharper than most of our modern digital cameras today. Wow. Well, you can you definitely get the impression from it because it looks so much clearer. Now, when you expose it to the light, I noticed you had a stopwatch in your yes. hand. And um, this, this camera, there's there's no no buttons, no no mechanics. There's nothing to that camera other than a box with a hole in it. Yeah. So I have to figure out how many seconds to expose each each time for based on the amount of light. And it seems also because it takes that time, that might also explain why you don't see a lot of people in those photographs of that era um, doing much like smiling because it would. Well, smiling, it's a, a misconception is that it took too long because most people think it was a, a 30 second, a minute, five minutes. Yeah. And it really wasn't. Three to ten seconds was Yeah, average. that's about what it looked like. And the reason why they didn't smile was more social. It wasn't socially acceptable. This was, this was a serious event. Oh. This might be something you would do once in a lifetime. Yeah. You didn't want to look silly. Yeah. So even Mark Twain was quoted as, as saying one of the worst things you could do would, would be to have a silly grin on your face captured for all of eternity. Yeah. And what a terrific, I guess you would say, uh, heirloom to hand down through the, sure, to the once, family. And that's the other thing I tell people, oh, digital is great, but this, this isn't up in the cloud. This yeah. is in your hands. Yeah. Once, I, once I finish this, once I varnish this, there's no reason why it won't be here 150 years from now. And now we can get a picture of what they look like today. <laughs> that's right. These are time travelers, ladies and gentlemen. They came, they were, that, that picture was taken in 1861, and it is uh, now uh, 19, uh, 18 or 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you something. Uh, what did you, wasn't this kind of a cool thing? It was. Yeah? yeah? Did you have a little fun doing that? Yes. <laughs> and is this going to be sort of an heirloom for this little one? It is. When I saw that picture, I actually thought it was like from, from the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't seen you, have you? No, I haven't. Yet? Seen uh, wait till you see, I mean, seriously. You really sell it, because I, I don't know if it's the beard or what, but it really looks like somebody from that era. I honestly thought that was a picture from the era, not one that he had taken. been a great day and here at the uh, at the cemetery we were able to take in so much of Medina's history and so much of Ohio's history I really hope that you enjoyed this as much as I did and I know that I'm gonna actually look up some of these people at their websites and and on Facebook just to learn a little bit more by the way when you get an opportunity tune in again I think we're going to see some more great things about Medina's 200th Bicentennial. Fantastic. Thank you, and thanks for watching.
trying to get out of your way. If I can, I'm trapped.